Okay. <clears throat> so I need to know whether people in the outside world can hear me. Uh, so is anyone speaking on hash Wikimedia Dev? I know there's a second of delay or two. You have to keep talking, perhaps. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you for coming. I'm sorry for the delay in starting. This is a few Python tips. And so I am presenting a few tips to help you work effectively with Python. This talk is aimed at experienced programmers who are accustomed to other scripting languages and to new programmers for whom Python is their first language uh, that is a secondary focus. Has anyone spoken up on Wikimedia Dev? For joining in. OK, all right. Um, so I would love to know whether uh, I, is there a way that you can actually make me the focus just for a second while I continue talking until I start typing? You are the focus now. I am? Uh, OK. Everybody, everybody can. Uh, okay, you, uh, you, mean, you mean the, the video? Yes, of the video. Well, I, yeah, OK, great. Um, so this talk is not going to discuss programming basics, why you might choose to work in Python at all, web frameworks such as Django and Flask, Wikimedia Python projects such as Wikimetrics, PyWiki, MW Client, MW Parser from Hell, um, scientific computing as a whole, uh, and scientific computing distributions such as SciPy and NumPy, Twisted, I mean, there's a lot I'm not going into. Really, I'm aiming here for breadth rather than depth. And uh, the point here is to give you a little taste of a lot of useful stuff and show you just enough to show you why I use what I use. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail for any one thing. And of course, all my notes and links are available on MediaWiki.org, so you can follow up. They're on the talk page of the meetings page. So there's meetings, 06, uh, 19, 2014. And the talk page of that has all the notes that I'm working from, including links and including the actual specific commands that I'm running. Although I need to clean that up because I know it doesn't distinguish between stuff I'm running at the regular command line and stuff I'm running inside a Python interpreter. Is there anyone who has spoken up because they are actually able to see or hear me? Nope. All right. Um, I hear by request that if you are watching this live, Please go to Freenode and go to hash Wikimedia Dev, uh, that is Wikimedia Dash Dev, and speak up and say that you are listening so that I know that this is actually going out. This is one of the first of these that I've done. Yes, I can hear. Fantastic. Francis. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> I'm going to cover four big topics initial setup, things to try while debugging, color st or, sorry, code style tools for coding conventions, and favorite modules. Um, and in just a few seconds, I'll uh, switch to just screen sharing my terminal. But just for a few seconds, I have a few thoughts on setup that you need to know. Well, the first is the big question that a lot of people start with, should I be writing my code in Python 2 or Python 3? Now, Python 3 came out in 2008. And basically, the entire Python community is really slowly transitioning from Python 2, often Python 2.7, to Python 3, uh, 3.2, 3.4, and so on. If you're writing new code, if possible, I advise you to write it in Python 3. That, for instance, is what Aaron Hafiker in analytics has done with his MediaWiki related utilities. But there are some libraries and dependencies out there that are not compatible with Python 3 yet. That is less and less of a problem over time. In general, I advise you to try to be writing in Python 3. It will work in general. But the examples I'm going to be giving you right now are Python 2, just because that is still the default on most systems when you run Python, like when you type Python at the command line. But I am open to debate on this after this talk. So I am going to assume that you have already installed Python on your machine however that works for you. If you go to python.org, that will give you instructions on how to install it on Mac, Linux, and Windows. Um, so now I'm going to switch to screen sharing, or rather you can switch me, yes, exactly. So once you've installed Python, the next thing you should do is install the, the package manager pip. 
Um, and I personally find it annoying that you have to do this separately, that it doesn't just come with Python, but they are fixing that in the new version, and pip will just come with Python. There are installation instructions available online. There is a link in my notes. If you are contributing to MediaWiki right now, you probably already have pip installed because it's part of the process for getting Git review set up. So you probably don't need to actually install pip. But in case you do, go ahead and do that. Um, PIP is your interface to the Python package index, also known as PyPy, and that is where most of the Python ecology lives in terms of reusable Python code. So I'm going to give people just a minute now to install PIP on their own systems if they don't have it installed already. Um, so uh, speak up on Wikimedia Dev if you have any problems, and other people can probably help you. I'm not going to be waiting for most of the rest of this talk, but just because so much of the stuff I mentioned is installable with PIP, I just figured now's a good time. What's the conversation? Mm -hmm. All right. I will show you one cool thing about PIP. This is a list of what I have installed, um, that, I, that I've installed via PIP. This is a kind of classic uh, command for dependency management, PIP freeze. And so you see not just what I have installed, but also the version numbers. And I've installed various, a lot of things because, you know, I knew I was going to be running this tutorial. So you can see I have a lot of stuff here, and it's great that I have access to all these modules. And it's great that it's so easy to install something, like pip install simple JSON. Oh, it turns out I already had it. All right. Um, and if I wanted to uninstall it, I would just do pip uninstall. Um, but this causes two problems. One, what if I start working on two projects that require different versions of a particular module? Like, one of your code bases needs PyTwitter version 1, and the other needs PyTwitter version 2. And second, how do I keep track of and easily tell someone else what dependencies my specific project requires? I'll just say Control-C here. I'm just not going to even do that. Um, so we use virtual environments. And sometimes you'll hear people call them virtual ems or vems. Uh, and I have installation instructions for virtual environment, uh, the virtual environment tool in notes. Within a virtual environment, you can just pip install something uh, with no sudo, and then it's only available in that environment. So I use virtual env wrapper, which provides a little syntactic sugar and tracks where all of the virtual environments are. And I have a link also in the notes to where you, how you can install virtual env wrapper to install that. So I have virtual env and virtual env wrapper installed. So I can make a new virtual environment. OK, I've named it foo, so now it exists. So I'm now working within foo, as you can tell, because it uh, prepends to my command line prompt foo. And now, if I do pip freeze, then there is just some default stuff that I guess always gets set up in a new virtual environment. I could probably configure that if I want. So now, pip install simple JSON. All right. And uh, so now it's installed. So now if I do pip freeze, it's listed in here. So now pip install simple JSON. Yep, I want to uninstall that. Yep, it's uninstalled. Now, let's say I don't want to be working in that anymore. I hit deactivate foo. Now I'm back in my regular shell. Um, if I decide, oh, I want to work on foo again, work on foo, it actually tab completes. Yep, and uh, deactivate again. And now let's say, oh, I'm done with that virtual environment. 
then I can rm virtual m. And uh, that it's uh, you know a special directory with some uh, dot files, and so it doesn't take that long to create or to destroy. So the last bit of setup that I'll talk about here is the interpreter, the command line environment where you can type one line of code at a time and see what Python does with it. And you'll also hear it called a REPL, a read, evaluate, print loop. Now, when you install Python, it comes with the stock interpreter. And this is what a lot of you are used to seeing if you've just started working with Python. Um, it, as you can tell, uh, tells you what version of Python is running, and you can do simple stuff. All right, what is the value of A? It's two. All right, I can define a function. And it runs. Um, I can also, this is something you might not know, you can get automated help on a particular thing. Help A. Well, Python knows that it's an int, so it gives me generic help on the int object. So that's great. And just like on the regular bash command line, you can easily go back to something you've done in the past. I hit the up arrow just now, and that was the last command. I hit up, and it goes reverse chronologically. A is 2. Um, let's say I type something that I don't actually want to do, just like on the back command line, I can hit command C, and it doesn't evaluate, it doesn't register. Um, and if I hit up again, then as you can see, blah isn't in the history, so that's nice. Just like on the bash command line, it has reverse interactive search. I'm hitting control R right now, I type A, the last thing that I typed that had A in it was simply just the letter A. If I type space, then it knows that the last thing that I typed that had A space in it was the assignment A equals true 2. So I'm going to hit control C, and that doesn't evaluate. And so now, um, anyway, so control C. Um, and if I want to quit, the easiest way to quit out of the interpreter is you'll probably memorize the command combination, control D, but uh, if you need to type it out, then you can quit like that. So that's the standard Python interpreter. Uh, I really, you know, I do a lot of work in it, but I want to mention two other interpreters to you. One of them is especially good for sharing your work, and it's called IPython. You would install it with pip install ipython, and then you activate it on the command line, like that. And it also tells you what version of Python something is. Um, but uh, the big reason to use ipython is so that you can make ipython notebooks, which are web-based presentations that let you show your code and the output. So I'm not going to give instructions right here on how to let, uh, install and run that. But I am going to briefly show you an example from a Wikimedia volunteer. So I'm briefly going to change what I'm sharing my screen to. Um, this is an IPython notebook. And as you can see, it has a title. It has some text in it that you can have just sort of as annotations in English. But you can also type in bits of Python and then it actually evaluates them and prints them out here. And so you can see step by step how a bit of work is done as you see the code and then an output. And so for instance, you can plot things and make graphs. And then you can actually show people all of the work that went behind the graphs in addition to the graphs themselves. So this was uh, by Merlin Van Dien, Valhalla, and this is just a sample of what you can do with IPython notebooks. So I'll just switch now the screen sharing back to my terminal. Um, and so that's IPython, and that's what that's really for, in my opinion. The third REPL, which I use a lot, is great for exploring new stuff, and it's called bPython. BPython, you install it using your operating system's package manager. Like on Debian, you use aptitude. So I just typed bPython. And so as I type, 
things pop up. Like, I just put a dot there to say, okay, what attributes does A have? And now I can tab complete. So for instance, let's say I want to um, capitalize. There we go. Um, and it pops up information on what you can do. So here are various things that I have available to me that I might be able to import, different modules. So uh, if I'm trying out a new library, here's import MW client. OK, MW client dot, and here are various things I could do. And maybe I know that I want to do something involving a site. I type the opening arrow, or uh, I type a dot split opening arrow, uh, or opening uh, parentheses, sorry. And it gives me the signature, what kinds of things that are available for me to do, and uh, gives me some help tips. So I really appreciate this when I'm trying to explore something new. So, and it lets you undo something you've just done. That's another nice thing about the Python. So let's say b equals 2, b is 2. Now I reassign that, b equals mag. OK, I've hit Control r That redoes everything except the very last thing that I t uh, put in. So now b is back to 2. So I like this for exploring. By the way, are there any questions or thoughts in with Media? Yeah. OK. So that is some information about setup. Um, and you should go ahead and try exploring those various interpreters, because there's a lot more I haven't gone into. Uh, things to try while debugging. A lot of people don't know about the minus i option when you run a Python script. Basically, it runs a script, and then it dumps you into an interactive session with the Python interpreter at the state it was at the end of the script. So you can dig around and see what values are stored. So yes, OK, that, that exists. That's great. So now I'm just going to show you this bit of Python that I wrote. OK, this is really simple. Uh, there is. I'm importing random so that I can choose a random thing from a range that I create. Basically, the range of the uh, integers from 1 to 10. And then I decide that I would like to print that uh, a random choice from that. And I go ahead and print it. So let's say I just do that. Well, then it's just going to print a number, which in this case is 4. Here at 6. Fine. All right, now I add the minus i option. And you see that after it spits out a number, in this case 2, I have an interpreter available to me. This gives me a list of the strings that are available in the global scope. And you see that I have here things for rignum, random, and to print. Random is that uh, a module that I imported. And then rignum and to print were things that I defined. So if I ask, well, what is to print? It's 2. Um, this is a really simple example, but you can see how this would come in handy, especially because, uh, let's see. Um, uh, J Jonathan Morgan asked if I could share the link to the example IPython notebook. That is in the notes. That is in the notes on MediaWiki.org on the talk page of the meeting itself. Are there any other questions that people have asked that I Not should on answer? The, on the... All right, great. So you can see how this would be helpful. Python minus i spits you out after the script has finished running or crashed. But maybe you want to see what happens just before it crashes. Or you want to be able to sketch, uh, figure out what you want to happen next just before it crashes. So another thing you can do is use PDB, the Python debugger. If you've ever set breakpoints in a program so you can step through it, then this will be familiar to you. I realize now that I should probably be putting these little code samples that I'm running through also on MediaWiki.org. And so I will be doing that after this talk today. So here, um, a few things happen, most of them really quite trivial. I import PDB, the Python debugger. I define a function kind of just to have something to do. 
I assign two variables, I then print them, and then I try to print something called spam that I have never defined, so you know it's going to error out. All right, so now Python demo of PDB. All right, so where I said set underscore trace, that's what sets the breakpoint. If you set breakpoints in a program so you can step through it, this might be familiar to you. The PDB environment is different from the regular Python interpreter. It lets you step through lines or continue to the next breakpoint or evaluate expressions. So now I'm typing S, which is stepping to the next line. All right, B equals two. Type S again to step the next one. It knows that print is A. All right, so if I now ask it to print A, it does. It tells me that it's one. Now I'm typing C, which means instead of stepping line by line, continue to the next breakpoint or until it crashes. So it's done a number of things. Tries to print spam. I continue again, and it crashes because spam is not defined. So now I know that I have a chance to do this. The most common thing you'll do is set traces, but there's a lot more you can do. There was a talk at PyCon. I have a link to it uh, in the notes uh, this year that was in-depth PDB, and there's a reference manual, which I've linked to. One more debugging tip, and I've already alluded to this. When you're just starting out, you may want to know what you actually have defined, what is in the global scope, and whether or not something is in your path, so Python knows how to get to it. So, opening up bpython, all right, dir, as you can see, this uh, if called without an argument returns the names in the current scope. So, right now, it's very little, a equals one. Dir again, now a is listed as one of these. And you can see, if you've successfully defined a variable, it shows up in the list of strings in the current scope. So I called it here, so it's returning what's in the global scope. Let's say I import sys. Sys is a pretty useful module. Um, so now, dir, yep, sys is now also a string that's in the global scope. Sys.half. This is all the places on your file system it knows to look if you are trying to, for instance, import something. So if you've tried to install some Python library and it doesn't show up in sys.path, that is something you can follow up on. So that it finishes what I was going to cover for some very intro debugging tips. Now I'll move on slightly to style. The standard for how you should style your Python code, spaces, comments, naming conventions, is called PEP8. Python Enhancement Proposal 8. There's a link to it in the notes. And you can automatically check whether your code complies with PEP8. You import PEP8, which you can install with pip install, um, and you can fuss around with it on the command line of the interpreter, or you can fuss around with it in Bash, like on your, uh, in your regular terminal. So what I'm doing here is uh, calling up where PEP8 is. Uh, which in this particular case is in uh, user local lib. And then I'm telling it to apply the rules of PEP8 to the interaction example that you saw, and it tells me that there is some missing white space. I'm gonna span this out a little bit, run it again. Yeah, it says I'm breaking rule E231 and I'm missing some white space after a comma. All right, well that's good to know. Um, sometimes there's something even more complete, uh, completely breaking a lot of rules. Here, I broke, it, I broke a whole bunch of rules about where I should have had uh, two blank lines instead of one, I should not have had spaces around certain keywords or parameters, and so on and so on and so on. So it's nice that you can automatically check that. There's also a module you can install called pep Adify that actually tells you what change to make. So I run that from the command line, pep Adify a particular file, and it basically gives me a diff. And in fact, 
I can use the minus W flag. So this will be this will be the first time I've run this in this live demo. So this is the moment demo curse should apply. This will actually write the change to the file and add the comma between the two arguments that I've given to range. Let's see what happens. Well, yep, it did it. Here's the space. Wow, I have defeated demo curse for a little bit. We'll, we'll see if that holds up. So my own experience with PEP8 and pep Five and another useful link or two are at a blog post that I've also linked to in the notes. You can see how this will be nice. You know, if you're getting code from other people and you want it to conform to PEP8, you can even specify which rules you care about and which rules you don't care about. So you could even just put this in a link checker on your own machine or in Jenkins or something like that. All right. So those are some code style tips. Uh, are there any questions from Wikimedia Dev? All right. Nothing related. <laughs> oh, all right then. I guess it might be worth checking Wikimedia Office in case people thought it was there. Mm -hmm. I can check, but yeah, yeah, it's fine. All right. So now a few favorite modules. I've already alluded in the past to random, but it's just so neat. Import random. OK, so now A equals range, let's say, from 1 to 15. OK, what is A? When you do that, it creates this list, the sequence of the integers up to not including uh, 15 from 1. So random.choice just gives you a random choice from that list. 11, what have you. Since you're so often doing something like this, you don't even have to do that initial step of creating that range that I called A. Random.randrange just gives you a random number from the range that you wanted to create anyway, and of course you can give various arguments to that to configure and specify it in various ways. Random.sample gives you k unique items from a list. Here let's say I want four unique items randomly chosen from this range that I've created. So it gives me non-repeating, uh, what's the saying? It's a sample without replacement. So I think this is cool, and I could imagine, you know, as you are making your various gambling games, right? This is a very important thing to be able to do. Um, and if you just want a random float between 0 and 1, there's random.random. So this just gives you some float between 0 and 1, and you can grab whatever you need from that if, if that's all you need. For instance, if you just want to check whether something is even or odd, or uh, if you want a better or worse than 50% probability, you know, that kind of thing. So that's random. It's one of my favorite uh, little, uh, little modules. It's in, built into the standard library. Requests. Request is also known as HTTP for humans. Basically, if you are making basic API requests to websites over HTTP, then you should not use the built-in URL lib2 part of Python standard library, because it is going to make you write a lot of boilerplate code that you shouldn't have to write. Requests takes care of that for you. So um, Francis is watching, and at this point, I'm going to grab a chunk of her code from a project she has called Auto Wiki Facts, which tweets out sort of randomly chosen obscure facts from Wikidata, Wikisource, Wikivoyage, Wikipedia, and maybe some other projects. There we are, obscurefact.py. I have it here in um, my directory, and therefore I can import it. Because if you have a .py file in your path, you can import it with import name of file. Now I have 
scrapped like 80% of what Francis wrote just to make this a super small example. Um, so, as you can see, we import requests here. Um, we create some headers, uh, like the user agent, namely. And we define a function, Wikipedia recent, recent change. We create a URI. And here is request.get. It asks for the URI and headers. And then you can just easily get the JSON, go through it for what you need, like let's say a page ID, a title, a page text, and then return that. So, um, Python import obscure fact, obscure fact dot Wikipedia recent change, and there we have a recent change from Wikipedia that is evidently about chocolate covered foods. Mm. That sounds a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So request makes this a lot easier, uh, and you don't have to do nearly as much uh, funging around trying to like figure out how to convert it to JSON or construct the URL query or whatever as you would with request. Request also supports HTTPS. Uh, request supports some kinds of auth, so it's, it's absolutely worth looking into instead of trying to use what's in the standard library. So unit tests. So I will uh, now show you I give a shadow right there off of my <laughs> Oh, I should actually just run this for you, shouldn't I? Okay, Python speech.py. All right, a tech buzzword. I'm going to say uh, service oriented architecture. Oh, only one. Okay, so I'm going to say SOA. I, I, I didn't allow spaces, evidently. This was not uh, exactly the most robust thing in the world. Um, the next is going to be NoSQL. What's the third tech buzzword that I should add? It's a lot. Agile? Agile. That's a big one. All right. Like big data or something. Oh, yeah, that would be good, too. So. Basically, this is kind of like Mad Libs. It just takes a bunch of elements and then it combines them into what would be like a, a speech by President Obama that was like, my fellow Americans, I know Agile is more important than ever. That's why I've committed the federal government to implementation of SOA within the next 100 days. And then within the file, I also have some like names of actual bugs that we've had in our system, like thumbnails of large PNGs are not generated. Thank you, and may God bless Agile. And if I were to run it again, it would be a little bit different. Um, anyway, uh, so this is not very important. I just I figured I guess I may as well show it to you. But I, I did it in te with test-driven development. Um, I created a bunch of tests using the unit test module, which is built into the Python standard library. And then I created classes of test cases, each of which subclassed from the test case class within unit test. Um, and I defined various tests. And then here is where the last bit is, which is where I assert that the thing I think the result should be is you know, what comes out. And therefore, the test will not pass if that assertion is false. Here are a bunch of tests. I think I wrote like seven. And then at the end, def main, unit test main, if name equals main, main. Uh, that basically says, if you run this from the command line, then please run all these tests. So you can, I can now run this. All right, Python speech tests.py. And it ran seven tests, and they passed. Yay, my test passed. I sh you should know that people here in the room are applauding, applauding my <laughs> test-driven development of the silly Mad Libs Obama speech thing. This was a project that I did at Hacker School, which is why I had it lying around and it's in my GitHub. Um, you can check how much code coverage you have with the coverage tool, because you want to know, all right, what proportion of my code paths are covered? 
it's a fool's game to try to get to 100%, but you may as well try and get, you know, from like 20% to 70%, possibly. Um, or you might want to just know which code paths are not being covered. So there's a tool called Coverage, which you can install with pip install coverage, and there's a link to the installation instructions in the docs in uh, my notes. All right, so coverage run speech test.py. Okay, so it ran it sort of within this manager of coverage. So now if I ask for the coverage report, then it tells me that uh, I have 73% coverage of speech and 100% coverage in speech tests. Um, and coverage can give me an HTML version. And now um, I just need to go to the right place. And then share that. And you can see what is being covered. And you can see what I haven't tested. It's in red. I have not tested these things. So that's why I'm not at 100%. Whereas speech tests, it looks like everything's good. Cool. So now I change my screen share back to that. All right. So that is code coverage. And one last thing, UTF-8. So in Python 3, uh, all strings are Unicode, so you won't have to worry about this. But if you're working in Python 2, you will run into a zillion headaches over UTF-8 and ASCII conversion. So use the Codex module. There's a link to that in, um, uh, there isn't yet. I need to add a link to the, uh, the um, documentation of the Codex module in the notes, but I will do that. So. Let's say it. Import B Python. Import Codex. All right. So I will show you a kind of annoying example that won't be as spectacular as I want it to be, but I hope will at least show you a little bit of why it's useful to use Codex so that you get the Unicoder or whatever uh, you know encoding that you want. So here I will start without using Codex. And I'm just opening up a file. Um, I will briefly explain what I'm doing here. Um, I am using a list comprehension instead of a for loop to strip the new line out of every line in the file and create those, uh, put those into a list that I'm calling name list, and then print name list. Oh, whoops. I meant .txt. There we go. So you see that each of these is a string and it has these control characters in it, and it basically thinks they're ASCII. You can tell because it doesn't have the U before the uh, initial apostrophe here. Um, so that's going to cause trouble if you want to integrate with other things. So for instance, if you want to feed it into our API, uh, under certain circumstances, you're going to run into issues. So now let me show you what it's like if you use Codex. With Codex open. That's an interesting way for bPython to be. Spoke too soon when you're talking about demo gods. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, 
So uh, the, the code that I actually typed is in the notes because that's what I was operating off of. Um, but you see now that there are some control characters, yes, but also there's a U before each of these strings indicating that these are Unicode strings. So um, name list, name list, um, let's take the fourth element in name list. Um, and let's see. Uh, I don't, uh, off the top of my head, I can't exactly remember how to ask Python, hey, what is this thing? Uh, well, why don't I try? Help. Name list. Three. It's a Unicode object. It's an object. And so, anyway, uh, these are some things that are worth looking into if you have to deal a lot with basically non-Latin characters, which if you're operating in the world these days, you probably are, because every once in a while you have to deal with a name of something that does not come from US English. So um, that is everything that I was aiming on covering today. So I see uh, this is good. This is good because uh, my sl this is a practice talk for Open Source Bridge next week, where I have about 45 minutes. And this took about 40 minutes because we started so late. Um, so that'll uh, I'll probably speed this up a little bit uh, for next time and have a little bit of room for questions. But right now I do have, I guess, a few minutes for questions. So I'll stop screen sharing. And uh, let's see, is there anything that I ought to do now? Uh, I guess I would. I can. I can ask for questions on Wikimedia we Dev. Yeah, we can wait if there's any questions sure. so far. I haven't seen. Anything I guess I should go ahead and ask: Are uh, are there parts of what I've discussed today? that sound especially useful, like you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and use that. And are there questions about anything I said that seemed really unclear? Like, I know I was rushing through things, but my aim was to at least give you approximately 10 nods of recognition of like, oh, I understand why I would use that. And so I want to know what especially was appealing and what was like, no, I still don't understand why I would use that particular tool. Perhaps you have some thoughts, Teresa, since you're actually here. <laughs> I thought it was a bit fast-paced. Um, I've used most of the tools already, so I kind of like can follow along. But it was it was a lot in 45 minutes. It didn't feel like 45 minutes, but it was a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think if you were going to do the speech, it would be good to have the link of your presentation first and like show that so people can kind of follow along, or have it open. Because that helped me. You're just like typing furiously, and I'm like, what is going on? I was on? typing too fast, probably. I could probably stand to type slower. Uh -huh. and I, I know you probably have like your screen split in half, so that's why the screen share was kind of like uh -huh. smaller. It also makes it harder to read. It does. You're right. Um, As someone has, that has used only deep and a bit of the interpreter, I found useful to that used to new steps. Like I was surprised that the the unit test and coverage was so simple to check. I was expecting something like I don't know more black magic behind. So I love B Python was really cool. B Python is amazing. I've never used B Python, so I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah, I've always used IPython and IPython notebook. They're all great. You know, they're great. I didn't realize it's B Python. You just rewind stuff. That's it's pretty cool. It's a time machine. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. More people should know about vPython. Especially, you know, if you ever used one of those IDEs that has intelligent completion, you know that, OK, yeah, you don't always want to be using it because sometimes it's distracting. But if you're exploring, like, a new API, it's really helpful. It's cool. Yeah. Um, I also didn't know that coverage had, like, HTML. I mean, I've only used coverage. It's always printed at the end of our test yeah. cases. So right. It's already eventually just added on the bottom, but that's cool too. Yeah, yeah, and I like the HTML version for the thing that I showed, where like, okay, here in red, these are the chunks of code yeah. that you don't have coverage of. Yeah. 
Because usually it just has little like line numbers, and you're like, whoa. I know. Looking at like just that little mechanical step of not having to look up the line numbers yourself, right? It's nice. Yeah, Ned Batchelder is the person who's the main developer on coverage, and uh, he is a very like thoughtful and empathetic person, and yeah. so I think that comes through in the design of coverage. I mean, it works, but it works better. Yeah, yeah, now, now it works even better, yeah. And I mean, there are some situations where all you want is that textual note on the command line, and then you know that's fine too. I'm glad that unit test and coverage, you could see clearly how to use it. That's really important. I mean, yeah, I'm not trying to be a zealot about, oh, everyone needs to get to 100% coverage. That's uh, obviously a fool's game. But uh, being able to know, oh, I thought I was testing that code path. It turns out I'm not. Like, that seems useful. So I'm going to ask. I'm not going to ask. Francis asks. Francis, uh, I'm not familiar with the with syntax. OK, so what I was doing there is not specific to codex. It is something that we do a lot in Python when we are doing something like opening a file or making some kind of connection. Because uh, when you use with, that is creating something that we in Python call a context manager uh, to say, all right, as long as x is true, you know, call it y, or so on. Um, and this, uh, if you don't use with, then you have to manually open the file connection, do stuff, and then actually manually say close. So it would be something like, you know, f equals open blah 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 file. Do the things you want to do with the contents of the file, and then close. You would you would say close the file. And if you use this with pattern, then you don't need to do that. Uh, you can um, uh, you, you, you don't have to manually close the file. And so if you look up in Python documentation advice about how to open a file, uh, then you'll see that with syntax. Um, so my video call seems to have ended because my connection was lost, which is just probably a Wi-Fi problem. But I'm still here. I think we have about five more minutes. Are there any more questions? Good reviews. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll just wait another minute or two, and then um, we'll see. Uh, would you mind pinging Jonathan Morgan specifically to ask if he has any questions? Because he did have a question earlier. Uh, JMO? I believe you changed the name to oh. like college or something. JMO Lunch. Oh, JMO Lunch. All right, well, I guess that takes care of that question. So another thing, I thought maybe you could change the syntax um, highlighting on your, because it's hard to read when it's just one block of text. Also, some of it was like when you did the dot, like it didn't show up really well on yellow on yellow. Yeah, I, I thought I had changed it to something that would be better, but I see that now that it was wrong. You know what it was? I changed something that's better for projectors, but worse. Aw. That's great. I changed this color scheme just before I got in here to something that's better for projectors, but worse for actual screen sharing. So I should have actually left it to green on black, because that would have been fine. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I think that marks us as done. So that was about 40, 45 minutes long. Thank you for joining us, people, right now and in the future. And please do keep up on our other future tech talks. Good. Thank, Thank you, Samantha. So